Hi everyone, it's Ajanet. I'm here for your chapter three lecture. This uh, week, we're gonna be focusing on uh, uh, exploring strategies utilized in human services. Uh, by the time you're done with this particular chapter, you'll be able to discuss the fact that most interventions or solutions need to kind of be customized. Uh, you'll learn about the different strategies that we, we employ in actually developing those intervention plans and some of the activities involved in the work that we do. It's important to understand that there is no one-size-fits-all solution. There's not a universal solution because circumstances are complex, right? People are complex, especially in a pluralistic society where we have very different and sometimes divergent value systems. Those can be influenced by our own experiences. They can be influenced by our families, our cultures, right? And so we value different things. How we view the world may differ distinctly from one family and one person to the next. Additionally, you know, um, things change over time. We gather new information. And so our understanding of the world and our theories about human behavior, cause, causes of human problems, and what we know to be effective solutions, all of that knowledge base changes. And so our solutions change, our ideas change, right? At one point we thought the earth was flat. Uh, now we have enough data to understand it no longer is. So anything that was proposed that centered around flat earth is no longer applicable anymore. So we have to be mindful that our solutions are gonna be ever evolving, just like our knowledge is. Additionally, it's important to understand multi-causality, and we're gonna talk more in depth about that in this particular uh, chapter, so you can understand the complexity. So let's first talk a little bit more about values. What are some of the key issues where we disagree? Think about larger social problems or concepts that might be related to human services, right? Parenting and um, child services or child protective services or um, child care. Uh, even elderly care, parenting comes into play because uh, it really does affect the relationship dynamic now between the aging parent and sometimes the adult caretaking child. Um, gender norms and the roles that we've played in life and in our homes and in our fa families uh, are sometimes a reflection of gender norms and those may uh, differ across families across cultures we may even fight on on those issues where in some cultures um, women are allowed to have positions of leadership uh, in some cultures women have to cover their hair uh, and their clothing and and so all of those things reflect our values and, and influence our interactions, right? And maybe the problems we experience and the solutions that might be appropriate. So all of these areas that I've listed are some key areas where we disagree, um, even most recently with the social protests. Like some people disagree that we should even be protesting. Um, I'm a believer that that is a core American value. So whether I support the issue or not, the fact that they're protesting, to me, is a source of patriot patriotism, right? Like our country allows for those things and that's, that's a valuable, valuable um, constitutional right. So um, why do we have these differences? Well, actually, if I could direct your attention to the right-hand side of the screen, and look at the unique individual identities, right? So social identity theory suggests that we have all of these different identities. We have our racial identity, our ethnic or gender identity, our class, our language, all of these areas, we have our own identity. Some of those identities bring with them privilege. Um, some with them bring with them power. Others bring with them marginalization and oppression and we're looked down upon. And we may even actually experience blatant um, discrimination as a result of those identities. And that's unfortunate, but that is that uh, unfortunately is a, um, a very harsh reality of life. And so 
think about these larger key issues, um, particularly like let's the LGBTQ community, where there's legislative efforts to, to literally erase them. Uh, and that's not okay. And so um, it might affect, um, you know, someone that's cisgender differently than someone that's transgender. It may affect a gay male differently than it might affect a transgender woman. So all of these identities intersect and that intersection creates unique experiences and unique value systems as a result. And so I want you to be mindful of the complexity of the world and the diversity that exists and how that shapes our differing values. Consequently, consequently it might also influence um, a need for unique solutions. Another thing that you have to understand and why one size doesn't fit all is because we have different attitudes about the world which then guide the behavior. So we take different action based on those attitudes and those belief systems. That starts with who we are biologically and genetically, right? Genetics influence personality, genetics influence attitudes. We know this to be the case brain structures, biochemistry, all of that affects my functioning, my attitude, and the choices that I'm going to make as a result. Individual families um, and, you know, your, your sometimes both your immediate and extended family, depending upon the nature of the relationship dynamic, they most definitely influence my attitudes. Family may be a core source of what informs our attitudes and worldviews. Other reference groups that might influence you and shape you include your friends, uh, your coworkers, your neighbors, um, your fellow students, right? Your, your academic colleagues, all of these things um, and all of these groups might influence you and your value systems and your attitudes. Social class. Um, I grew up poor and that has had a profound impact on my development and consequently how I view the world, the attitudes that I have toward others, the attitudes that I have toward the homeless man that was sifting through for bottles at Safeway. Um, I'm, I'm gonna look upon him with a little bit more grace and compassion because I know what it's like to be homeless. To know, I know what it's like to not have the money to pay for food and to feed your babies. And so I look upon it differently. Um, my own culture and being part of the Hawaiian culture and how we value aina, malama aina, right? Um, we value taking care of our land um, and we recognize our land as our ancestor. And so she provides for us and nourishes us. And in so doing, we have the privilege of taking care of her. And so that can influence my norms my customs, practices, and traditions as it relates to how I engage with the land and the world at large. And then finally, there's things related to time, timing of events, but cohort effects, right, where they affect cohorts of people. Maybe the era in which you grew up, for instance, if you grew up in the Depression era, you value frugality. You, you might have a little bit more skepticism about the government. Um, all of those things and experiences from that era are going to shape my attitudes and worldview differently than let's say a millennial or a Gen Zer, right? Uh, and so understanding that the era, the generational effects, um, growing up in a technology generation was very different than a World War II generation. Um, the major events like those of us that were old enough to understand what was happening when 9-11 occurred, that shapes our attitudes very differently than someone that didn't experience that. And the last thing that really helps us to, or that we should ponder as we're thinking about why there's not one size fits all is kind of just what changes over time naturally, right? Uh, historically, we used to believe the earth was flat. Well, we've since had evidence to disprove that. And so consequently, you know, the social norms change, the attitudes change around that topic. And as those um, social norms, what may have been kind of taboo becomes more commonplace, the attitudes 
evolve and change and maybe even inspire new theories. But when we're talking about human services, we cannot do a one size fits all. We cannot say, well, that worked last time, 10 or 20 years ago, it should work again. We have to understand the need to look at the individual fact pattern and develop an implementation and response um, that makes sense for those circumstances. So let's talk a little bit about multi-causality. When we're talking about multi-causality, we really are talking about complexity. We're talking about problems that have multiple sources um, uh, that contribute to the challenge at hand, right? There are multiple causes contributing to the dynamics and creating the social problem. So it's a very dynamic, interactive relationship. And when we talk about interactive relationships, we're talking about doing a statistical and research analysis of those relationships. And is the effect of A dependent upon the effector level of B? When that's the case, it's said to have an interaction. And those interactions can be very complex at times. Uh, and when there are complex issues at, at play, we know there's not just one single solution. It's not always a simple um, problem and solution. Uh, there may not be a simple cause, right? It's hard to develop a solution and intervention when you don't even know the underlying cause. And most definitely because there's not a simple solution or a simple problem, there's not going to be a simple intervention either. So these are what we call intractable problems. There's problems nested within problems nested within problems, and they all affect one another and build off of one another. And this has actually inspired the grand challenges of social work, where they are these collective, very lofty, huge social problems that have been identified. And we have a goal to eradicate, eradicate those problems, to address those needs. That's why they're called grand challenges, right? Because they are significant and substantial. So homelessness may be one intractable problem. It's not just about not having a house. Sometimes there's addiction involved. Sometimes there's mental health involved. Sometimes um, there's individual psychological factors involved and motivation involved. Sometimes they're, they're actually reinforced uh, and they, they have some liberation and freedom around being homeless that they don't want to step back into uh, a, a working world that might be more demanding. So all of these things help to highlight the fact that it's complex. Multi-causality is real. So let's talk about six principles of causality in general. So um, you, you always have a degree of uncertainty as it relates to your cause and effect predictions. Um, we always want to explore the possibility that, that we're wrong. So we're never 100% right or wrong, even on commonly accepted theories and information. Um, it's usually within a certain probability, within a certain degree of confidence. Um, it's always more complicated than it appears on the outside, right? It's very rarely going to be a simple solution. And so consequently, we need to be prepared for that. We need to be prepared for the complexity. And then additionally, you have these personal issues at play and these social issues at play, and they may interact or they may overlap, but we need to recognize that problems are often being um, fueled by mul from multiple directions, and so solutions might need to be coming from multiple directions as well. When we talk about six principles of causality, um, beyond the it's complicated, right? The fourth, fifth, and sixth um, are listed here. And it's really now, okay, so we know it's complicated. There's, we know there's multiple problems at play. How do we prioritize them? That also might be values driven. But when there is a problem nested in a problem, then it's like, well, which one do we fix first? Do we fix the mental health first or do we fix the homelessness? Do we fix the employability or do we fix the homelessness or do we do it both concurrently 
Additionally, you have different people experiencing the same exact problem, right? Um, maybe there was different circumstances that led to those problems, but they're the same core problem. And so we have these subgroups, which adds to the complexity of the problem as well. And the complexity of the situation, of the solution. So number six, um, it's really important to recognize we all react differently. So what might be a minor issue to some, it might be huge, a transformative life circumstance to others. And understanding the individual needs of your client, understanding the circumstances of your client, what strengths they bring, what challenges they have, what fears they have, and how that might impact their ability to implement solutions is really important. So when you're talking about intervention strategies, there's three primary intervention strategies. Direct service strategies, so that's when you're providing a service directly to the client. Indirect services, so you might be engaging in activities that support them, but you're not providing the direct intervention. Like I might refer them out to resources or give them a referral, uh, but I'm not necessarily providing those services. So that's an indirect service. Then there's also systems change services where I'm looking at the larger system, the broader cultural values, and I'm saying what's working and what's not, and let's edit what's not. So here's a list of some direct service um, strategies, and then you, here you have some that are direct service and some that are self-change. And then these ones on the end are self-change. Self so they kind of um, reflect a degree of separation, right? Or this is hands-on. This is a little bit less hands-on, but still very active and engaging with the community. And this one's let's focus from the top down and let's address the systemic issues. Um, and let's talk about how we can collect and analyze data in meaningful ways. So, Here's going into them a little bit more for direct, you might do like case management, counseling, teaching, caregiving. For indirect, it might be a little bit more kind of around the beaten path where it's more of an outreach and you're building those connections with other sources of membership. Um, or it might be, you know, again, I do the resources for the group. So it might be that I have to, um, follow through and, and post resources or offer someone a referral. Doing it as a warm handoff is much more effective where I'm taking them to a particular person that can help them. And then finally, there's the broader systems change where maybe I'm doing advocacy, maybe I'm doing lobbying, maybe I'm in the legislative hallways and I'm educating our elected officials about a particular issue. Maybe I'm in a lab and I'm doing research and I'm collecting data. Um, all are important, right? All are very important, and we need to recognize that. Um, we want to show respect for all those that are in the human service field, whether they're doing direct human services or otherwise. So common tasks that we engage in, in human services, as we're working with our um, client base, right, we have our caseload to manage, we want to gather data. That can be data directly from the person where we interview them to better understand the problems and the dynamics contributing to the problems. Whether we're reading other published work and material and maybe we're looking at um, reports from grants where they've doled out money and then you have other institutions that are writing their reports on how they utilize that grant. Um, so all that kind of stuff is important. Number two, where we're storing and sharing information, do we want to develop some cohesive system, right? But there should be some intentional, purposeful record keeping. That's what makes it empirical in nature. And then additionally, how are we sharing that out that information? Are we going to conferences? Are we doing speaking engagements? Are we holding office hours? But we want to document how we're helping to, um, you know, accumulate this information and then how we're willing to disseminate it and who we're disseminating it to. And then additionally, you are going to be negotiating contracts, right? You have to assess a problem and then develop a contract that makes sense with that particular 
um, student in my case, but whomever you're working with. You know, make sure that when you're doing a contract, you're outlining your mutual expectations. What are you hoping to gain out of the contact contract? What's your partner hoping to gain? What rules should we adhere to? What processes do we want to implement to ensure that we're honoring those agreements set forth in our original contract? You also need to build a really trusting relationship. People are your greatest assets. Those relationships and connections are powerful because you know, we become exponentially greater than we are by ourselves individually. And so we want to show that warmth. We want to show that genuine empathy and that compassion. We wanna model it for ourselves as well. Um, but we definitely want to have, build that relationship and community with others in our discipline. And then we also need to design action plans for intervention. And unfortunately, those are going to vary from person to person, household to household. But they're going to in the, the gist of it is they're telling you what steps need to be taken to support that particular individual um, or that particular problem. So it can be valuable. But the action plan is closing that loop of communication. It's going back through and making sure that people follow up on what they need to follow up on. Um, but you are definitely uh, bringing it full circle and not just sending out a follow up uh, and then they never do it, right? You need to make sure it's done and then follow up with them again if it's not. And then finally, we want to monitor and evaluate work. We are constantly changing and evolving, so we constantly need to be learning and gathering data and um, letting that inform our perspectives as well. So with that, I'm going to leave you to your reading. Um, our theme, this particular uh, module is do something great, right? Choose a field in human services that makes your heart go pitter patter. Understand the history and dynamics, not just of the field overall as discussed in chapter two, but of your particular field and maybe your particular organization. And then find ways in which your values align with that organization and think about the strategies that they utilize to provide for those in need as it relates to the social problem they address. And do something great to support those people in need. You are in entering a much needed profession. Much love and aloha to all of you and your families. Um, I so appreciate your hearts of service and the work that you're entering into. It is very, very much needed and appreciated. Mahalo nui loa. Have a good one. Aloha.